All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, today's topic is vegetable gardening for beginners. So I hope everybody's getting a little excited. It's time to start getting those seed catalogs out and start planning our garden as we learned a couple weeks ago. So today I'm just gonna to talk to you about vegetable gardening for beginners. Uh, it's a topic that a lot of us really get excited about. Obviously it's a really big topic. Um, so we're not gonna be able to dive very deep into it today. I mainly just wanted to kind of orient you to the topic a little bit and let you know about some of the resources that WVU Extension has. My name is Jody Richmond. I'm the Extension Agent in Mercer County. And I'm also the coordinator for the Vegetable Gardening and Beginner Gardening Series. All right, so the first thing that I wanted to throw out there for those of you that may not know, um, we do have a lot of fact sheets available for gardeners across the state. Um, this is the landing page for the gardening series. So if you go on there, we've dropped the, those into the chat. Um, this is just the gardening 101 page and you can see that there's a lot of fact sheets available if you scroll down through there. We also have some fact sheets that are topic specific and these are called our gardening guides and those deal with a specific type of vegetable or produce that you want to grow and they will contain not only growing like the production information the pesticide information the the um common types of diseases and uh and bugs and things that you might want to deal with with that production um, but they also contain nutrition information so these are generally garden guides that we have developed to go right along with the um grow this series. So those are also available. And again, we put those links in the chat. All right, so decided you wanna have a garden. So some things that you might want to consider is your specific site. And we talked a little bit about this earlier is how you plan out that site. Um, things that you may want to consider is your actual access to water. This is the first thing that always comes up when people tell me they want to do some raised beds or a school or community garden wants to go in. I always ask them is, do you have access to water? And people are always like, well, I can carry water. Well, I can tell you right now, you don't want to be carrying water when it gets um, in that heat of summer and it's dry and August is out there. Um, so you want to make sure you have easy access to water. One of the things that you can do if you don't necessarily have great access to water is to use something like a rain barrel. Um, so the mini gardeners are really interested in doing some of those types of projects. Another thing that's really important is your sunlight that's available, um, both the duration of sunlight and the intensity of sunlight. Most vegetable crops need at least about 10 hours of daylight a day in order to, to mature and ripen properly. There are a few crops that will do okay in a, in a shadier situation, and those are going to be some of our cool weather crops. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Um, but if you want to grow a cool weather crop more up through the summer, something like um, broccoli, cauliflower, peas, something like that, if you're going to grow that through the summer, then it really needs to be in a shadier area so it doesn't get too hot. Anybody that's ever grown broccoli knows that if you let it get too hot in the summer, um, it will bolt. Uh, so those are some of the things that you want to consider. Your planting zone, we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Your planting zone d determines what kind of crop you can grow and when that growing season is. The type of crop, I just mentioned that, whether it's a warm season crop or a cool season crop, um, that's going to be one of those things that's really important because it's going to tell you when you want to plant that particular crop. And also your planting zone is going to delegate when that frost and freeze is going to most likely occur for the last time in your area. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But the one thing you really want to consider is what do you like to grow? Um, if you participated in Stacy's topic a few weeks ago about planting your garden, you know, that's probably the most important thing is what do you even want to grow? You shouldn't be planting things that you don't want to eat. Sometimes people will say, well, I plant tomatoes because my grandma planted tomatoes. Everybody plants tomatoes. But if you don't like tomatoes, then don't plant any tomatoes. Then we're going to talk a little bit about different types of gardens. Um, most people, when they think of a garden, they think of a traditional in-ground garden and lots of other opportunities. It could be raised bed, it could be containers, it can be vertical. So we're going to talk a lot about different types of things. One thing I want to mention is when we talk about site selection, um, slope, this one at the bottom, this picture here doesn't have a whole lot of slope, but there is a little slope there. So one thing that we do is if you have a slope, you want to to plant across the slope instead of up and down. And the reason why we do that is because if you plant up and down the slope, then when the rain comes, it will wash out your crops and it will lead to erosion. So that's just one way to kind of address the area that you have. 
All right. I always want to throw this out there. Um, every year we do an extension garden calendar. I hope some of you guys have one of those. Um, if you have not gotten your extension garden calendar, check with your local extension office. Um, some counties still have some left. Other counties have run out. But every year we do have this garden calendar available. And the garden calendar tells you different dates to do things throughout the year. And it's tailored for West Virginia. So for this week, some things that it says it's a really good time to do right now is to apply dormant oil to your fruit trees. You can go ahead and prune all your trees and shrubs. We do want to do that in the dormant season before things start budding out. Um, you can also propagate things like grapes and blueberries from your hardwood cuttings. Okay, so if you don't have a calendar, uh, right there in the slide is the link, but you can also just search for WVU Extension Garden Calendar if you want to print off your own. Or you can check with your local extension office and they may have a few left. All right, I threw this out just a few minutes ago about the planting zone. Some of you may be familiar, if you look at your uh, seed catalog, you may see what's called the USDA hardy zone. And that gives you a map of the United States and it gives you different zones. So West Virginia is normally in about zone six. Parts of it may be in five and parts of it may be in seven. But what we do at WBU is we have divided that out into three different zones um, for West Virginia. And your zones tell you the last frost-free date. Um, and that's really important because you don't want to plant warm season crops, things like tomatoes and peppers. You don't want to plant that before your last frost-free date. Okay, because if you do, the frost can kill your plants. Um, if you happen to get a layer of frost or we're expecting a frost, you can do something like cover up those plants to try to save them. Um, but we really don't want to have to be doing that for a really long time. So normally we advise you to not plant those plants outside until after your frost free date. OK, so we have we have divided the state up into three zones, um, A, B and C. And of course, A has the latest frost free date so it has the shortest growing season which is 145 days that you have 145 days of a really warm growing season that you can actually grow those warm crops in okay and c would have the longest growing season okay the other part that's that's important to remember down here is the first killing frost all right we want to have all those crops harvested before that first killing crop frost there are a few exceptions to this there are some cool season crops that can take a little bit of a frost all right, so when we talk about containers, if you're gonna do a container garden, a lot of people like container gardens. All right, let's put something in the chat. Anybody put something in the chat if they can see something wrong with any of these containers. Does anybody see anything? Move it to the side here. Anyone? I think that the this is Gloria. I'm thinking that the um the flower box is too small for it's going to become root bound and it I'm not even sure if there's drainage. Okay, excellent. So, and I'm going to see a few things in the chat too. So you guys are coming up with some great answers. Okay, so Gloria mentioned that this flower box here has way too many plants in it. Okay, flower boxes are great things. Um, it's a great container to plant in and it also makes it visually appealing, um, a way to decorate the outside of your house. But you always want to plant for the mature size of the plant. Okay, we get these little tiny plants and then we think we really have to fill that out. But when those plants mature, there's not enough root space and they're over competing here. So you, there's way too many plants here. All right, somebody else mentioned about the tomato cups. They're way too small. Those cups are way too small, right? So somebody has started those seeds in those cups, but they've let the plants get just way too big, right? And we see this one all the time. Um, it's okay to do that, but you need to transplant those or put them, if it's, if it's too early to put them outside, then you need to transplant them into a bigger cup, okay? Let's see what other people com commented overcrowded, hard surfaces, solo cup too small. Okay, so you guys came up with some great things. A couple things that you might have noticed on this one up top, um, this is actually a tropical plant. Now, if this is planted in West Virginia, um, you're gonna have to bring that in for the winter, okay? Can you carry this big old plant inside? 
<laughs> maybe, maybe not. I know I could. Um, so that's one of the things you want to think about when you're doing container plantings. If you have to move that back and forth, this big old pot is very heavy and this plant is huge. Okay. This one right here, somebody mentioned overcrowding. Um, one of the things that's really important for vegetables is you need proper air movement. Um, so this one probably needs to be staked out a little bit and you need to have those cu cucumbers moved out. Um, the other thing that's really important is you need water drainage. Um, so that's another thing that, that could be an issue. Okay. All right, vertical gardens. Vertical gardens are a great option, um, particularly if you don't have a lot of space, you can do a vertical garden. If you're mobility limited, um, if, or if you have other issues, they can be a great way to get those plants up off the ground. And it can also be great for those plants that need to climb, okay? So it's a perfect height for picking. So these are just a few examples. This one down here is a palette. And if you do a search for palette gardens, you can get so many great ideas about different ways to garden on palettes. This one over here um, is, is great because it's just strings. It doesn't take a lot of expense. Something down here like a fence does take a little bit more money, but if you just do strings, um, beans, peas, all those things can climb up strings just fine. This one right here is just a, a cherry tomato plant that's hanging down instead of up. The one with the squash and gourds is kind of neat. You can't really tell from the picture, but it's an arch and you can actually walk under it and pick those things. So it's kind of decorative and it works at the same time. All right, so here's some more just kind of container uh, and, and other options. In a few weeks, Alexandra Smith is gonna talk about um, non-traditional gardening. Alex did our fact sheet on straw bale gardening, which is the one that you can kind of see there in the middle, but there are lots of different ideas. Um, there's going to be another one on an extended gardening or um, extending your harvest. Uh, so we do a little hoop houses or raised covered ra raised beds a lot. So there's some information about that. This one down here with the squares is called square foot gardening. If you're not familiar with that one, you would use each square and it tells you how many plants you can put in one square foot. So for a lot of our plants, uh, things like cabbage, cauliflower, tomatoes, peppers, you could of course only put one in there. Um, but for things like uh, cucumbers or radishes or something like that, you can put more than one in there, okay? So that's just another option. A lot of you maybe have, um, some different kinds of raised beds, something like this. Sometimes people use troughs or something like that. This one's kind of great because it's a little taller. So if, if you do have a little bit of mobility limitation or you just want that up off the ground a little bit higher, that's a good option. One of the greatest things about raised beds is because that soil is raised off the ground a little bit, um, you can actually plant a little bit later or a little bit earlier, I'm sorry, in the season and extend that harvest a little later. You can extend it even more by putting the hoops on top of it, like this, the one on the top left corner. Um, and you can actually grow things a lot earlier by doing it that way. The one where you see someone holding it up and you have the roots, that's a hydroponic bed. Um, and that's where the plants are actually growing on water. Um, and those, those setups can be really expensive and really extensive, or they can be really simple. It can just be a bed where there's styrofoam trays floating and the uh, plants are, are floating in the styrofoam on top of water. So that, that's a couple of different non-traditional options. All right, so this one is just a raised band handout that we have. Um, and it just shows you how to build your own raised bed as one option, sorry about that. We did drop this in the chat if this is something you're interested in. And it's just using two by 12 lumber and PVC pipe that you can get at Lowe's. This, a four by eight bed right now costs you about $120 to do it this way. And a four by four bed is about half that cost. Okay, so this is just an easy setup if you're interested in doing something like that. We put that together. A few years ago, it was half that cost, um, but you know the, the price of lumber has is much higher now than it used to be. Okay, soils and fertility. Uh, if you participated, Two weeks ago, um, you could have participated in our soil testing class. We do encourage everybody to get their soil tested annually to find out what is 
what is in your soil and what you need to supplement. Um, in a couple more weeks, we're going to have Brian Sparks is going to talk about soil fertility and using fertilizers. Um, so of course we do recommend that you do have that soil tested so you know, and then we can tell you what you need to add. Most vegetables like a pH of around six to seven, which is pretty neutral. If you need to increase your pH, um, then you can add lime. If you need to decrease your pH, then you can add some type of sulfur compound. In West Virginia, most um, soils typically need lime. Um, they normally have a more acidic pH than you want. Um, some exceptions are going to be plants like tomatoes and blueberries, like a little more acidic. Um, and there's, of course, tons of different fertilizer choices out there. I have just a couple really common options here. A lot of times home gardeners like to use something uh, like miracle Grow, and that's perfectly fine. I just wanted to mention that like this particular miracle Grow here is a 12-4-8. Um, and what that is, is the NPK would be 12-4-8. Um, compare that to a 10-10-10, um, what those numbers mean is it's the percentage of nitrogen, the percentage of phosphorus, and the percentage of potassium, okay? So basically what I'm saying here is this is only four pounds, and this is only, and this right here is 40 pounds, and they're the same price. Um, and the nutrients in there is fairly similar, except for this is only four pounds, and this is 40 pounds. Um, so Brian will explain that a lot more later. Um, but that's what we try to tell home gardeners. It's not that miracle Grow and products like that are bad. It's just that you're really paying for the convenience because you're getting less than a tenth of the nutrients in this one than you are in this one, okay? And, and Brian will walk you through some of those calculations um, in his session, okay? The one thing that miracle Grow does provide is it also provides some of those other micronutrients that you may or may not need depending on your soil test. All right, so when we talk about choosing our varieties, um, WVU does do every year, we do variety trials. And what a variety trial is, is we will work with different growers across the state to grow, say, 10 different varieties of beans. And they will grow them out, and then they will tell us, you know, they will kind of rank them. Like, this was the best bean for taste, and this was the best bean for yield. This one grew the most amount of beans. And this one was the, had the least strings. And when we canned it, this one is the one that tasted the best. Okay, so we do that for lots of different crops. And then they actually, actually print a variety trial handout um, that's available for gardeners across the state. All right, so that's one of the things that you can look to. Um, one thing that is really important is that cool season versus warm season. And again, cool season crops are those, those crops that you can plant a little earlier in the year because they can take a little bit of a frost. And that's gonna be things like um, broccoli and cauliflower and peas. All of those can, can survive those cooler temperatures. Uh, things that are warm season are gonna be a lot of those crops that we really think about growing in garden more often. Those are gonna be like tomatoes and beans and peppers and squash. Those are the things that don't really survive a frost very well. Okay, depending on your type of crop, that's going to give you your planting date. And for a lot of people, that's going to be you don't want to plant until after that last frost day. Okay, now your harvest date is going to be important because it's going to be determined by the variety that you pick. Um, so different types of tomatoes are going to have different harvest dates because it takes different types of tomatoes longer to mature. And, and how you will know about those two dates is going to be on the seed pack of and we'll show you one of those here in just a minute. The other thing that's important is when you're actually planting them, how deep do you plant the seeds, okay? And a rule of thumb is two to three times the width of the seed. So those little tiny seeds, you just barely poke in the ground, whereas something bigger like a squash seed or something like that, you're gonna poke it further in the ground. And this chart that, that's on there, that is in the Vegetable Garden for Beginner uh, fact sheet. Okay, so here we have just a typical um, seed packet and some things that you're gonna notice 
is the planting depth. That's what I just told you about. Seed spacing. Of course, the seed spacing is going to depend on what you're actually growing. Things like tomatoes need to be much further apart um, than something like peas. Spacing between rows. Again, that's going to be the same thing. You just need air, air spacing between the two plants. Um, proper spacing between plants is very important because it allows for air movement and that will help cut down on diseases. Days to germination, that's just how long is it going to take that seed to sprout? And days to maturity is how long it's going to take that um, fruit, the fruit on the plant to actually mature to the point that you can eat it. All right, seeds versus transplants. Um, you're going to have a program here in a couple weeks um, actually talking about seeds and then another one actually talking about transplants. Um, so we are going to learn more about each one of these. But of course, as most of you know, Seeds are much lower cost generally than transplants, um, but it does take it longer to harvest if you plant a seed versus if you plant the actual plant. Another great thing about seeds is you can store those seeds over for another year. You just need to store them at, at a lower temperature and without moisture, okay? So normally we recommend that you do that in the refrigerator. You will, however, often have to go back and thin those seeds. We, th we sow them a little thicker and then we go back and, and thin them out. And that on the on the uh, tomato packet right here, it says space after thinning, okay? So that tells you how much space the, the mature plants need. A germination test, um, if you have older seed and you're not sure if it's gonna be really viable or not, then you can actually do a germination test, which is where you dampen the seeds on a, a damp paper towel and you lay out a set number of seeds and then you give them time to sprout and you count the number that sprout and that tells you um, what your germination percentage is. All right, transplants. Uh, these are how we buy a lot of our plants, which kind of helps accelerate that harvest. And it also creates a more uniform yield because you're taking away that germination factor. You're getting rid of all those seeds that don't sprout. Um, it does, decrease the labor from thinning so you don't have to go back and thin those plants um, and it also decreases the time between the crops so something we don't really talk a lot in, in this presentation is about succession planting but succession planting is when you plant a cool season crop then you plant a warm season crop and then you plant another cool season crop so you can actually get kind of three harvests out of your garden or your raised bed okay hardening off is when you um, raise your own uh, seedlings and before you plant them in the garden you need to let them slowly get used to the cooler weather because you've had them inside and they've had this really nice warm environment since they've been that little seed and if you take them outside and you plant them in the garden and all of a sudden they have fairly cold nights it can shock those plants um, and, and it can be detrimental to the growth so you need to slowly acclimate them to those cooler temperatures for a week or so, and that will help them um, have a, a better survival rate. All right, so disease control. We talk about something called IPM, which is integrative pest management. And we talk about that for both diseases and for insect prevention. And what that is, is we don't just go out there and spray something. We try to look at what all of our control options are. Um, and things like cultural controls are things um, that you can manage the garden a little better. And that might be things like you choose the right seeds to start with. There are some seeds that are resistant to certain diseases. And you'll see that over here on this um, chart here. It, it tells you common um, varieties for tomatoes, and it tells you some diseases that they could be resistant to. So if you choose a variety, say, that is resistant to blight or verticillium wilt, um, and you're just not going to have as much chance of having that disease. And that will help you a lot further than just going out there and, and trying to spray something. You also can do some things like crop rotation. We try not to plant the same crop in the same area of ground over and over because that continues to perpetuate a disease. Also, as I mentioned a little earlier, you want proper plant spacing so the air can move through there and it will help to present diseases. Things like watering the plants on time, anything you can do to increase the overall health of a plant 
um, will help it be more healthy to fight off diseases to start with. Um, think about you. When you're healthy and you're feeling well, you're going to be more likely to be able to fight off a disease than if you're just really tired and run down, then you're going to be more susceptible to things like that. The other thing that I mentioned here is trellising. Um, if it is a climbing variety, having that on a trellis, again, makes it spaced out a little bit better for that air movement. So it can be very helpful. Now, I do want to say that it's not that we're against um, spraying pesticides or anything like that. There are times when pesticides could be the very appropriate control. Um, so th there is a time and a place for that. Um, unless that is not what you choose to do. That's your decision as the gardener. Um, but some things like just purchasing healthy plants and seeds to start with. Um, don't ever bring a plant home that's already diseased or is already infested um, with some type of insect. Don't bring that home uh, because then it can contaminate the rest of your plants. Also making sure you sterilize all of your equipment. And that can also be things like your boots and your shoes when you're going through the garden. If you're around something, um, if you're trimming something that has a disease, make sure you sterilize that before you um, move on to the next plants. Another thing is proper identification, making sure you know what disease you have or what insect you have. And if you don't know, you can bring that to your extension office um, and we, your extension agent can either diagnose that right there or they can send that off to one of our specialists. Uh, we will have a program at a later date that talks about different diseases that are really common in the garden. So that's going to be an option um, later as well. And this one is talking about insect control and all of those things that I've talked about IPM also apply for insects. Um, prevention is the best method is to try to prevent those things from happening. Uh, we also have something called a damage threshold. Um, it's what level of damage is tolerable. Um, because these are natural insects, sometimes they're just going to be out there. But at the same time, you want to try to consider controlling that before it gets to the point um, that it's a, a massive problem. Uh, the other thing with insects that you need to think about is insects can sometimes look very different during their different stages of life, right? Okay, so if you think about something like a moth over here, well, it goes through those different stages before it gets to that moth. So you want to learn what it looks like in all of those stages so that you can identify that. And again, if you can't uh, identify it yourself, you can always bring in somebody that can help you look at that. Another thing that's important for insect control is weed management. One of the things that you can do is keep your weeds down so there's less of those things available. Um, another thing that is a good idea for insect control is sometimes you can bring in um, some of the herbs if you're interested in herb gardening. Um, some of those herbs insects don't like. Um, so some of those really strong smelly herbs, you can kind of interplant with some of these vegetables and it can kind of naturally keep some of the insect populations down. Um, then there's things like physical control versus chemical control. Uh, many of you probably already do this. You go around and you pick off the cucumber beetles or, or you pick off all, all those worms like an army worm or something like that before it ever gets to the point that, it, that it's a really big problem. All right. So that's basically our presentation today. I did do just a little slide here showing you some of the programs that we will be having coming up soon. Um, do we have anything? Anybody have questions? Or do we have any anything in the chat that we need to address? Okay. So um, some of I, you I'm I sorry. actually had a question. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, it's a lot easier for me to talk than type. So because I have vision issues. Um, Okay, I had just um just a couple quick questions. Um, is there a difference between, or are you going to cover it in a different session? Is there a difference between planting onions from seed and planting the slips? I heard something because I'm trying to grow big onions, uh -huh. and somebody I went across YouTube. Some gardener said you have to plant by seed to get that bulb real big for the first year because the second year onion um, does is more for focused on like reproducing itself. Okay, so onions are biennial, which means that it takes two years to grow that um, crop. Um, I, 
I do not know if there's a difference by planting it one. I don't know if it actually affects the size, the eventual size. Um, it will, of course, delay you one year um, by going through that extra life cycle. Normally, we plant that little bulb and then you get the onion that year because you're like, you're cutting out that first year by planting the little bulb. Um, but I don't know if you're wanting the biggest onion. I, I don't think it would affect that um, because we grow onions and they get really big. We have nice sweet onions. It's more a factor of allowing enough space between the oven, onions and having enough nutrients. Um, okay. So that's, I that's don't probably, think but... doing that extra step actually helps you grow them bigger. Um, but I can find out from our, our extension specialist. Great. Um, One more question. What is, am I too late to start celery? Celery. Let me check. Okay, celery needs to be started indoors and it takes 10 to 12 weeks. So I don't think so. Oh, I think you're okay. I, I'm devastated. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's see. What do we have? All right, Bonnie says she has patio citrus and she has to move them indoors and she does not recommend it. Um, Betsy mentions that many pallets are treated so you need to be careful um there is another thing a lot of times people talk about using treated lumber uh for raised beds you no longer have to worry about using treated lumber for raised beds um because the, it used to be that they were treated with arsenic and they're not treated anymore they're pressure treated um and the chemicals used in that process are not um no are not toxic um, we have a question on how much to water a raised bed. Um, I, I can't answer that because it's more, you know, it's an environmental issue. Um, it depends on your temperature and those type of things. I, I'd say the same thing as like when you have container plants, it's more a factor of, you know, check it and see if it, if the texture needs water. Um, someone else asked a question about the soil. Uh, they missed that class. Okay, for one thing, if you miss a class and you ever want to go back and watch it, they are available. Secondly, um, if you need to have your soil tested, um, we can put that back in the chat. Keely, can you add that to the chat? Yes. The WP yeah, I'll add that. Yes. Okay, you can always send them off to the soil test lab. That is an absolutely free service in West Virginia. The only thing that you have to pay for is the postage to mail it in. Um, okay, somebody says they use fence panels to build raised beds. It's a good affordable option. Um, the survey, by the way, Keely put the survey in there, the follow-up survey, and the code word is growing. Jody, I see a question about eggshells. So if you are using eggshells in your garden, do you need to do anything other than just crush them and sprinkle them to get the calcium? No. And another good thing about eggshells is people use eggshells for a couple different reasons. Um Eggshells is or is a calcium additive, but I wouldn't count on them really adding very much calcium to the soil because um, it takes a long time for that to, de to degrade. However, the other thing that eggshells are really good for, um, and I don't know if I had this in the slide, let me go back, um, is, is actually like a physical control method for things like um, slugs um, because it creates a rough barrier um, some insects, soft-bodied insects like slugs, do not like to cross it. Um, so eggshells work for that as well. And I noticed we've been getting a lot of questions about the um, the map that you shared earlier with the zones. Some people were asking yes. about their zones and if you could share it again. Is there sure. I, um, 
is it online somewhere by chance or uh it's in your garden calendar if you have it or the link that i posted that has the garden calendar has it um the planting zones okay um and someone says something about 7a yes for the usda hardiness map we are most commonly most of the state is in six there are some areas where we have as low as as high as seven and as low as five um and that's the other thing that's a little frustrating about that map is depending on where you look that map up there is some variation in it um and a lot of times garden calendars will pr will print that map not garden calendars i'm sorry seed catalogs We'll have that map um, because it's a map of the whole United States and there'll be different colored bands. Um, so that's why we do one for West Virginia because it can it kind of considers elevation um, and some of those other factors as well. I saw another question about raised beds. Does that um, change problems with insects? Um, or is it the same as if you have like in-ground beds? Um, in general, it's about the same. The one thing that's really good about raised beds, however, um, is like the hoops. You can use those hoops to put nets on. Um, and that's one of the really good things about like moth insects. Um, you can cover those beds during the time um, when those moths are flying and laying eggs. Um, you can cover that with a, a uh, like a light cloth um, during those times, and you can prevent some of those beetles, um, some of those flying insects. The one thing you do not want to cover them during, though, is things like squash and those that need to be pollinated. Um, you don't want them color covered when the flowers are on um, because they need to be pollinated. But you can cover them with that light cloth um, when it's not during the pollination season um, and they and they can still get sunlight or you can uh, cover and uncover them during the heavier infestation periods and that will prevent a lot of insect penetration. Um, someone mentions using aluminum foil um, to prevent squash bugs. Um, that is another remedy that, that people mention all the time. Um, some other things they actually use, like um, you can buy like a copper tape uh, that you can put down for insects like slugs is another one. Um, a lot of times metallic things, a lot of insects don't like. They're very resistant to that. Um, just talking about additives, um, people will ask um, about Epsom salts a lot. That That is a magnesium additive. Uh, is there anything else? Any other questions? Beer bowls work for slugs. Yeah, uh, that's another common remedy for slugs. Um, a lot of times they'll climb in there. I guess slugs are alcoholic, <laughs> but they do. Um, beer is another very common remedy for slugs. Spearmint um, and cinnamon around plants. Um, yeah, a lot of those, you know, people know about marigolds, but a lot of those smelly um, herbs like, you know, citronella and the citrus smelly ones, um, mint, can be interplanted. Uh, I think we have some uh, programs coming up related to uh, companion planting and um, herb gardening as well. All right. Please take the survey if nobody has anything else. Um, somebody mentioned hand pollinating things like zucchini. Yes. Um, um, of course, zucchini and squash and 
melons and all those things do need to be pollinated, but they're also very easy to, to hand pollinate with, with a brush or something like that. So if you need to keep them covered, that is an option as well. Um, that That's another thing we get asked about a lot of times. If you have like bumpy cucumbers that are misshapen and not the right um, not the right size and shape, that's generally a pollination issue. Um, so that's why I said don't leave them covered. But yes, you can hand pollinate them if that's the situation you need to do. Okay, someone asked, is Charleston in zone B? Some of the other lookup sites say we're 7A. Yeah, that is dependent on, like our map uses A, B, and C, um, but the, the national map uses numbers uh, and occasionally letters. Um, so our map doesn't necessarily correlate. Um, it's not like these are all six A, B, and C. Um, our map is separate from theirs. You have anything else? Oh. Potatoes, when can you plant them? Um, our um, traditional thing is that you shouldn't plant them until after the last frost date. Um, but, you know, that's the thing about the frost date. It's kind of always tricky. You don't really know if that's the last frost date or not. Um, but we recommend you don't plant them till after the last frost date. And that would be dependent on which zone you're in. Okay, somebody asked about a couple pesticides. Um, one of the one of the best pesticides that we recommend quite often, um, which is approved for organic use, is Bt Bacillus thuringiensis, um, and the reason for that um, is it's a bacterium, and it you put that on the plants, and it only kills insects that are actively feeding on that plant, um, and that means that it's safe for honeybees. Um, and, and anything that's not actually feeding on the plant tissue. Um, so it's it's good for like the squash bugs, like you mentioned, um, or those beetles or anything that's actually killing plant tissue. Um, so, and it's available in lots of different trade names. Captain Jack's is one of the trade names, but um, BT is one of the things that you'll see in a lot of extension pack sheets. And we do have, um, there's a program that relates to organic pesticides on um, organic insect control is going to be April 25th um, for any of you that are interested in particularly organic um, and then March 25th is going to be common insects in the garden both of those will be by Carlos Casada who is our entomologist and if anyone missed the survey link and um, have you haven't had a chance to fill that out, feel free to message us on Facebook or Instagram or however you found us, and I'll be glad to send it to you there. I think somebody mentioned maybe uh, aphids. Um, another thing that works fairly good if you just have a small area is actually just soapy water. Um, that's one of the common recommendations for aphids. I mean, we can give you chemical controls as well, uh, if that's something you're interested in. But... Oh, somebody asked, is there a better time to test your soil? Um, we normally recommend the best time to test your soil is in the fall. Um, the reason for that is because if you're going to add lime, it takes three to five months to be effective in your soil. Um, and if your pH is not in the right zone or the right range, then your fertilizer is not as effective. Um, so we normally, that's the ideal time is to do it in the fall. That way, if your pH is out of range, you have enough time to get your pH fixed before you would be planting and adding fertilizer. However, you can soil test at any time. Um, any time is better than not at all. Um, so if you're going to be planting this year, then go ahead and send it in now so you know what's in there. Um, most people are not that far out of the range that you would need to worry about it really that much. Um, 
the one thing we do see with home gardeners a lot is a lot of times we get soil tests back that say that your nutrient levels are actually too high. Um, and that's because a lot of times home gardeners continue to add um, fertilizer. Uh, and, and so sometimes your nutrient levels are too high. Um, so that's actually very common. But so the fall is the best time, but any time is better than not at all. And the lab is down to about two weeks or so right now uh, to get your results back. They will be emailed to you and a copy will go to your local county office as well. Um, so they're pretty quick. The one caveat to that is as we get closer and more people are sending in sur samples, uh, it could take a little longer, but they're, it used to take like six weeks. So they're getting faster. Uh, someone says that they heard that there are flowers that you could use to deter certain pests. Um, yeah, the most common one people usually know about is marigolds, but um, really any of those really scented strong flowers can be used. And there are, there are lots of herbs um, and we'll talk more about that in the herb gardening one. Um, but there are lots of herbs that have those strong smells that plants just don't, that, that insects just don't really like. Um, the ones you don't want to use is some of those really tender herbs um, like basil, those really leafy, tender ones they tend to really like. Uh, so you can tend to lean more towards the ones like um, sage and citronella. Um, some of those stronger smelling herbs are generally better for that. All right, last call for questions. Well, thank you so much, Jody. You did a fantastic job. And if anyone else has, um, you know, like I said, if you didn't have a chance to fill out that survey, um, just reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram and we'll get it to you. Um, and be sure to tune in next week um, and continue to earn points for your county this way. So thank you all.